Stalin is still popular in many parts of Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah. And Stalin's popular in many quarters inside Russia. Uh, and Stalin murdered more of his own people than he murdered people outside of the Soviet Union. And still to you, the ties of history turn not on individuals, but on s structural considerations. So, so Hitler may be a uh, surface layer characteristics of how Germany started war, but not the, really the reason. Well, history is a multi-dimensional phenomenon. So I hear. And we're, we're talking about interstate relations here. Yes. And realism is a theory about how states interact with each mm -hmm. other. And there are many other dimensions to international politics. And if you're talking about someone like Adolf Hitler, right, uh, why did he start World War II uh, is a very different question than why did he uh, start the Holocaust or why did he push forward a Holocaust? I mean, that's, a, you know, a different question. And realism doesn't answer that question. So I want to be very clear that, you know, I'm not someone who argues that realism answers every question about international politics, but it does answer what is, you know, one of the big, if not the biggest questions that IR scholars care about, which is what causes security competition and what causes great power war. Does offensive realism answer the question why Hitler attacked the Soviet Union? Yes. Because from a military strategy perspective, you know, there's pros and cons to that decision. Pros and cons to every decision. The question is, did he think that he could win a quick and decisive victory? And uh, he did. I mean, a a as did his generals. It's very interesting. I I've spent a lot of time studying German decision making mm -hmm. uh, in World War II. If you look at the German decision um, to invade Poland on September 1st, 1939, and you look at the uh, German decision to invade France on May 10th, 1940, and then the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941. What you see is there was actually quite a bit of resistance to Hitler in 1938 at the time of Czechoslovakia, Munich. And there was also quite a bit of resistance in September 1939. Internally or you mean? Internally, internally, for sure, yeah. Yeah, people had doubts. They didn't think the Wehrmacht was ready. And given the fact that World War I had just ended about 20 years before, uh, the thought of starting another European war uh, was not especially attractive to lots of German policymakers, including military leaders. And then came France, 1940. In the run-up to May 10th, 1940, uh, there was huge resistance uh, in the uh, German army to attacking France. Uh, but that was eventually eliminated because they came up with a clever plan, uh, the Manstein plan. If you look at the decision to invade the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, which is the only case where they fail, they succeeded in France, they succeeded in Poland, they succeeded uh, at Munich in 1938. Soviet Union is where they fail. There's hardly any resistance at all, right? Yeah. Well, and to say that they failed the Soviet Union, I mean, my grandfather, fought, I mean, from, from the Soviet Union, you know, there's a lot of successes early on. So there's poor military, I would say, uh, strategic decisions along the way. But it was, uh, it caught Stalin off guard. It, maybe you can correct me, but from my perspective, uh, terrifyingly so, they could have been successful if certain different decisions were made from a military perspective. Yeah, I, I've always had the sense they came terrifyingly close to winning. Yeah. Uh, you could make the opposite argument that they were doomed, uh, but uh, I, I'm not terribly comfortable making that argument. Uh, I, I think the Wehrmacht by the summer of 1941 was a finely tuned instrument for war. And the Red Army was in quite terrible shape. Uh, Stalin had purged the officer corps. Uh, they had performed poor poorly in Finland. Uh, and uh, 
uh, there were all sorts of reasons to think that they were no match for the Wehrmacht. And if you look at what happened in the initial stages of the conflict, that proved to be the case. Uh, the Germans won a lot of significant tactical victories early on. And if they focused and went to Moscow as quickly as possible, it's, again, terrifyingly so could have been a, a basically a topple topple Stalin. Um, and one thing that that's possible. That's possible. Fortunately, we're not going to run the experiment again. But yeah. one could argue that that had they concentrated as the generals wanted to do in going straight for Moscow, that they would have won. I mean, what Hitler wanted to do is he he wanted to go into the Ukraine. I mean, Hitler thought that the main axis. Uh, there were three axes. The northern axis went towards Leningrad. The central axis, of course, went to Moscow. And then the southern axis, Army Group South, uh, headed towards Ukraine and deep into the Caucasus. And Hitler believed that, uh, that that should have been the main axis. And in fact, in 1942, the Soviets, go, excuse me, the Germans go back on the offensive in 19. 42. This is Operation Blue. And the main axis in 42 is deep into the Ukraine and into the Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And that fails. But one could argue that had they done that in 41, had they not gone to Moscow, had they gone, you know, had they concentrated on going deep into Ukraine and into the Caucasus, they could have knocked the Soviets out that way. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that in the end, I believe that. I, I think in the end, the Soviets would have won no matter what, but I'm not 100% sure of that. So sometimes, uh, maybe you can educate me, but so sometimes, you know, they say, just like with Napoleon, winter defeated Hitler in, in Russia. I think not often enough people tell the story of the, of the soldiers and uh, the, um, the motivation and how hard they fight. So uh, it turns out that Ukrainians and Russians are not easy to conquer. They're the kinds of people that don't roll over and fight bravely. There seems to be a difference in certain people, peoples in how they see war, how they approach war, how proud they are to fight for their country, to die for their country, these kinds of things. So I think Battle of Stalingrad tells, at least to me, a story of extremely brave fighting on the Soviet side. And that it's a component of war too. It's not just structural. It's not just military strategy. It's also the humans involved. But maybe that's a romantic notion of war. No, I, I think there's a great deal of truth in that, but let's just unpack it a bit in, in the case of uh, the Soviet Union and World War II. The counter argument to that, um, is that in World War I, the uh, Russian army disintegrated. Uh, and uh, if you look at what happened when Napoleon invaded in 1812, and you look at what happened in 1917, and then you look at what happened between 41 and 45, uh, the Napoleon case looks a lot like the Hitler case, and it fits neatly with your argument, but World War I does not fit neatly with your argument because the Russians lost and surrendered. Yeah. And you had the infamous Treaty of Brest-Litovsk where the Soviet Union then, because it went from Russia to the Soviet Union in October 1917, the Soviet Union surrendered large amounts of uh, Soviet territory because it had suffered a humiliating defeat. My argument for why the Russians, let me take that back, why the Soviets fought like wild dogs in World War II is that they were up against a genocidal adversary. You want to understand that the Germans murdered huge numbers of Soviet POWs. Uh, the overall total was 3.7 million. And by December... December of 1941, remember the invasion is June 41, by December of 1941, uh, the Germans have murdered two million Soviet POWs. At that point in time, they had murdered many more POWs than they had murdered Jews. Uh, 
And this is not to deny for one second that they were on a murderous rampage when it came to Jews, but they were also on a murderous rampage when it came to Soviet citizens and Soviet soldiers, right? So those Soviet soldiers quickly came to understand that they were fighting for their lives. If they were taken prisoner, they would die. So they fought like wild dogs. Yeah, you know, the story of the Holocaust of the six million Jews is often told extensively. If uh, Hitler won, conquered the Soviet Union, it's terrifying to think on a much grander scale than the Holocaust, what, what would have happened to the Slavic people, to the, to the Soviet people. Absolutely. All you have to do is read the hunger plan, right? And they also ha had a plan... Uh, was it called Grand Planned East? Uh, I forget the exact name of it, uh, which made it clear that they, they were going to murder many tens of millions of people. And by the way, I believe that they would have murdered all the Poles and all the Roma. I mean, my view is that the Jews were number one on the genocidal hit list. The Roma or the Gypsies were number two, and the Poles were number three. Uh, and of course, I just explained to you how many POWs they had killed. So they would have ended up murdering huge numbers of uh, Soviet citizens as well. But people quickly figured out that this was happening. Mm -hmm. That's my point to you. And that gave them, needless to say, very powerful incentives to fight hard uh, against uh, the Germans and to make sure that they did not win. 